Graham Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Whoa, you lucky people! Two episodes of the show in one week. Don't be expecting that all the time. Um, anyway, uh, so today's episode of the show, it's, I think, quite an exciting one. It's not often I get the opportunity to share with you guys uh, a brand new independent bottling company. And I don't just mean a brand new set of releases or brand new to me. I mean brand spanking new, uh, which is always nice. It's nice to see um, the, the uh, sort of order, should we say, shaken up a little bit. Um, it's always nice to see new new players coming in. I mean, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, the whiskey industry as a whole is is going through a complete renaissance when it comes to um, inward investment and distilleries are being built, you know, pretty much left, right and centre. Um, but where most companies are sort of opting, you know, just to sort of spend a few million pounds on, on one distillery, I mean, and, you know, we, Building distilleries is not cheap, people, you know what I mean? Um, you know what, your average distillery, well, um, going to come in at least sort of somewhere between five and ten million, I would imagine. So not exactly loose change you find down the back of the sofa, is it? Um, but anyway, so like I was saying, most companies seem to be sort of quite intent, quite happy to build one distillery um, and um, and that's it. But Marussia Beverages are not like every other company. Oh, no. Um in their infinite wisdom, they have decided to build three distilleries. I mean, you know, talk about madness and talk about expense. Um, why am I talking about Marussia Beverages? Well, today's episode of the show uh, is looking at a range of, uh, of, of whiskies that have been bottled by a company called Mossburn Distillers. Now, Mossburn Distillers are owned by Marussia Beverages, and there is a tie-in, which I will get to in due course, um, as you probably know if you follow the Whiskey News that uh, recently uh, they've completed a distillery, a new distillery on Sky called Torbeg, I think it's pronounced. Uh, apologies if I've uh, crucified the pronunciation of that. Um, which is a fairly small distillery. I mean, it's just, just five million pounds. I mean, you know, peanuts at the end of the day. And, um, and of course, obviously, Marussia Beverages have got oodles and oodles of cash sat, in, or <laughs> sat around doing absolutely nothing. They want to build two more distilleries. Um, and they have indeed secured planning permission uh, at a site, uh, which was a former site of the Jed Forest Hotel in Camp Town, which is apparently three miles south of Jedburgh uh, in the Scottish borders. Um, not that I particularly know it, but that's apparently where it is being built, or they are being built. Um, so phase two, which I believe is going to get underway fairly shortly, will be the building of what they're going to be calling the Jed Hart Distillery, which is going to be a fairly small distillery, I believe three um, copper stills and uh, ooh, five five warehousing five warehouses which hold or should hold somewhere in the region of five thousand liters per warehouse. So you know, relatively small. Again, don't know the cost of that, but I would imagine somewhere in the region of, of five million or so. I think this is going to be a sort of um, uh, there's going to be a visitor center, and I think it's going to be sort of you know. Um, I don't know what they're planning to do, though I, th I get the feeling from what I've read about it, they're going to run it as a sort of slightly experimental distillery, uh, which could be interesting. Maybe they'll do something along the lines of McMyra and invite people in to sort of like go, I've got an idea, let's do some distilling. Um, or probably not, I suppose, if you've just lavished out several million pounds on a distillery, you don't want any old Tom, Dick and Harry coming around twiddling things, do you? Um, anyway, so, like I said, so you've got got uh, the Jed Hart distillery which which will be built I believe um, relatively shortly uh, now planning permission has been uh, obtained for that um, but like I said they're not just building one distillery or two distilleries they're going to build a third distillery and this one is going to be a big one um, apparently they're going to be building the Mossburn distillery on the same site I don't know whether they're converting the old hotel or whether they're going to completely demolish it I'm God only knows. Uh, I, I don't know a huge amount about it apart from it's going to have a capacity of somewhere in the region of 25 million litres per year. I mean, that is immense. I mean, take for example, I think the currently the largest capacity distillery in Scotland is um, Glenfiddich, and, I, and they 
churn out roughly about 14 million litres per year. So we're talking almost double that size. And, and Penfitic is not a small distillery. It has 11 wash stills and 20 spirit stills. So I hate to think of what's, how many stills this place is going to have and the size of it. It is going to be the size of a bloody aircraft hangar, I imagine. But um, hopefully it will look a little bit nicer than that. Um, I believe the plan from what I've been reading is to complete this particular distillery by 2021. Um, and um, well, apparently it's going to cost somewhere in the region of 40 million pounds. I do hope they've got a long-term plan to recoup some of that cash. Um, I imagine they probably have. I mean, uh, Marussia Beverages are not a small company. Anyway, to tide them over, they've come up with this independent bottling company called uh, Mossburn Distillers and Bottlers. And uh, I suppose if you're going to start chucking around somewhere in the region of £50 million, pounds, you're going to need to get some money in fairly sharpishly. So, anyway... Um, they've kind of taken, uh, as you may well know, a few years back they uh, purchased uh, the um, spirits company O de V, the sort of distributors, and I'd just like to say a big thank you to them for the samples for this week's episode of the show. And um, obviously they've harnessed some of the talent um, that is uh, within that particular company, and uh, we'll, we'll go on to speak a little bit about that when I actually introduce the lineup because there is a sort of tie-in-ish um, well yeah there is a tie-in obviously um, but anyway so basically this is brand spanking new I don't think anybody else has done a review I've not seen I think I might have seen one review online of of the two blended uh, malt whiskies that they're, they're producing but I haven't seen anything else about um, the single malt single cask bottlings they're doing um, so I'm I'm hoping this is going to be a first well this is going to be the first one on YouTube anyway. So anyway, that is a little bit about this particular company. Let's let's have a look at today's lineup. Shall we? I'm not a god, you know the truth. Okay, so um, the range appears to have been split into two uh, two sections, should we say. They're doing two blended molds, which they are calling the signature cask series and pretty much like everybody else that does a regional malt they're saying that it's uh, reflective of the characteristics of malts of that particular region so uh, we're going to kick off with the Speyside blended malt don't know what the components are but it's bottled uh, at 46 percent and you may or may not know that sort of Eau de were once um, they're not anymore uh, the uh, uh, distributors for Compass Box and they've obviously learned something from um, John Glazer and are playing around with hybrid casks well why not um, so the um, signature cask series is being aged in what they're referring to as their cask bill number two we'll get on to cask bill number one in a minute don't worry about that um, and so it's an initial maturation in a 200 litre American standard barrel uh, followed by a second maturation um, in a hybrid cask I'm guess I, I don't know the exact details and there are inf there is information on their website but as far as I'm aware it's a cask uh, which has been kitted out with um, Oloroso uh, sherry staves and heavily toasted heads so I don't know whether the heavily toasted head, heads are French oak or American oak or sherry or whatever I'm going to hazard a guess that it's um, probably a hogshead which has been restaved uh, on the inside and they've kept the ends and just sort of like heavily toasted them that's what I think they've done but obviously uh, I could well be wrong and the other one, the other blended malt, which we'll be looking at at the end of the tasting, because there's a little bit of peat in it, and it's kind of bookending quite nicely, I think, is uh, a blended island malt. So there is a little bit of peat in that. Um, two distilleries, one island distillery, one isla distillery. I do know the, the distilleries, uh, and don't know if I'm allowed to actually say what they are, but it's 75% of the island distillery and 25% of the island distillery 
and no when I toasted it blind I didn't get either of them correct so just goes to show doesn't it anyway so this is cask bill number one which is starts off in exactly the same way as cask bill number two in the uh, 200 litre American uh, standard barrel uh, but this hybrid cask is kitted out with first fill bourbon staves and again heavily toasted ends so I'm guessing again American oak uh, hogshead probably and um, yeah so that's basically the two blended malts then they've decided to do a range of I think it's seven initially seven um, single cask bottlings um, and two of which are a bottle at cast strength. Uh, I've obviously got four here. I've picked out the four which I think are the most impressive. Um, you can find out which ones I elected not to choose. Um, but these I think are probably the best ones, shall we say. So we're going to kick off with, these are all at 10 years old, uh, apart from the, the last one. Uh, or the penultimate one as the case may be. Uh, so this is a 10 year old Linkwood uh, distilled in 2007 and bottled at uh, 46%. Uh, second bottling we'll be looking at is um, a uh, Inchgower. Don't see very much of that about these days, it has to be said. Can be a bit on the neutrally sort of side. Um, so yeah, an interesting choice. Again, distilled in 2007 and bottled uh, all bottled I believe November last year I think uh, so again like I said 10 years old then we're going to have a look at the one of the cask strength bottlings this is the Blair Athol uh, 10 years old um, distilled in 2007 again and um, bottled at 59.8% uh, so as you can see from the colour uh, American oak aged as are all of them which is a, quite nice not to see any sherried monsters um or oh, no doubt they will come in due course but anyway we shall see and then the only non 10 year old well, aside from the two vatted malts uh this is a 2008 distilled uh ardmore uh, it's a nine year old and again bottled at 46 point 46.0 percent in actual fact so that's that's today's lineup uh and um, i think it's going to be quite interesting and um i think like i said no sherry casks whatsoever all nice and well apart from like i said in the um uh the the, the space side so should be nice pure crisp uh fresh clean and and hopefully really interesting single malt so um Let's kick off with a bit of a uh, vatted space eye then. So God bless and we'll never know them all. Right, okay, so let's see what the spray gives us in. Let's see what the nose gives us on the scent. Fresh, crisp, quite youthful. Um, some pleasant barley, little bit of touch of caramel, natural caramel I would hazard to guess that. Certainly um, there's... I don't know whether it states it on the bottle, but judging by the colour, I wouldn't. There is, there's no caramel in that, but it's not, so it's natural caramel. Um, bit of toffee, a little bit of dried fruit. It's pleasant. Um, I mean, I'm guess I think this is going to go on on the shelves forties, mm, um, which is it's okay. Um, the barley's got a nice kind of freshness to it, a little bit of gristiness. I mean, I, I think I'd be hard pushed to sort of figure out where these were from. I mean, they are space sides. Um, I mean, they're just very, very young, very fresh, barley, bit of, you know, bit of sherry character. Um, touch of earth, possibly. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a pleasant nose, uh, it has to be said. Let's see what the palace like. A lot more oak on the palate kicks off with the creamy American oak and then dives into into this into the sherry fruit a little bit of pruniness walnuts a little bit of raisinated fruit it again pleasant um, young little bit sort of 
heavy on the oak. I'm not getting, I'm getting a bit of barley. I'm not getting a great deal much else, it has to be said. It's, I'm not warming to it. The quality is very, very good. It's got a nice aftertaste, so, you know, kind of comes back with that sort of slightly Alsatian-y sort of uh, white fruits, a little bit of apple, possibly peach, pear, that kind of sort of thing. So, so it's very nice, it's very pleasant. If you like a fair amount of oak, then yeah, that's fine. For me, I would like to have seen just a little bit more spirit complexity, and I'm guessing part of that is going to be down to just the, the, the youth of the particular component. So, but then again, you start playing around with older spirit and up goes the price. So, you know, to keep it sort of reasonable price, um, you're looking at that kind of thing. Certainly, I don't get any French oak character, so I'm pretty certain that the, that the heavily toasted ends are certainly not French. I'm guessing, given the creaminess of the vanilla, they're probably heavily toasted American oak. Um, and there you go, might be an interesting avenue to look at. Um, I mean, you know, this is a kind of a sort of a, a John Glazer kind of compass box light kind of approach, shall we say? Um, why not go the whole hog and chuck in a bit of French oak as well? You know, but um, but I think as a, as, a, as a sort of as a drink in its own right, I think it's 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 pretty decent, and uh, uh, I certainly don't think you'd be disappointed if you purchased it. Okay, so let's move on to the first of the single malts. This is the 10-year-old liquid. Let's uh, see what the nose gives on this. Quite subtle. Um, again, fresh, lovely floral honeyed note. Sort of almost kind of orange blossom honey. Not quite over, not hugely orangey, but it's got a little hint there. Um, lovely freshness, some barley, a little bit of grist slight edginess there to, to, to the barley as well, a sort of almost kind of husky note, shall we say. Hmm, that is a very, very nice. I really like that. Um, it is, it's got enough complexity, but it's got, you know, freshness and, and, uh, and barley and exuberance. It's not hugely fruity. Um, liquid never is, generally speaking. Um, and this is a lovely example. A little bit of white licorice coming through now. Mm, lovely, aromatic, very, very summery. So, you know, um, and uh, not giving the game away, it's on the shelves at the moment, it has to be said. So, um, it certainly gets a, a big thumbs up from me. So, let's see what the power's like. A little bit more oak on the palate, it's certainly up front anyway. Sort of slightly clotted cream kind of character. But there is enough citrus uh, to, to sort of like, you know, sort of kind of cut that off on the mid palate to allow the barley, a little bit of fruit, a um, little bit of white fruit, a little bit of white licorice um, to kind of come through. It's got a reasonable length. Um, a little bit of gristiness on the finish, a little bit of honey as well. Not quite so much honey as that there's notes of on the nose, but I think kind of the oak is just sort of shaving a little bit of the freshness off there, so to speak. But I still think it's got a lovely citrus character. It's got some personality. Um, it's ten years old. Um, yeah, it's it, and and this the the issue I kind of have with all of these. Um, is the, the kind of pricing. They are a tad on the expensive side. Um, I mean, you know, I've got the nine-year-old um, Ardmore sitting on the shelf at 61 95 which is a lot of money for a nine-year-old Ardmore. And I don't understand quite how it is so expensive. Ardmore is not an expensive whiskey to buy. It's one you don't see very often, but pretty much most of it all goes off into the blend. So I can't see their the distillery or whoever they purchased the casks of charging a premium for that. Yes, the cask strength bottling is a little bit more expensive, obviously, you'd expect that, but um, 
I have taken them on. I do like them. I mean, I, I really like the Linkwood. I think it's a lovely Linkwood. Um, my my only slight reservation is the price, but you know, we'll we'll run with it and see what happens. But anyway, um, yeah, that's that's a nice Linkwood. Okay, so let's move on to the inch gower. Let's see what uh, the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Actually, got quite a lot of depth for an inch gower. I mean, like I said, inch gower can have a bit of a tendency to be a little bit on the neutral side, um, but this has got some 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 really quite robust kind of malty, barleyed um, character. Touch of gooseberry, a little bit of green citrus. Um, there's an edge as well. I, not a not a dirty edge. It's it's an edge, a sort of a barley grippy kind of um, edge, um, and all, and, and that that sort of kind of gooseberry kind of note kind of gives it a little bit of an austere kind of um, demeanour, shall we say? But again, not too bad, not too shabby. Um, touch of coffee, possibly. Um, Again, the thing I'm noticing about these is that certainly on the nose, they're not showing a huge amount of oak character. So um, I'm guessing sort of refilled American oak. And um, yeah, nice, pleasant, lets the spirit kind of come through. You know, you get distillery character, which is what I'm always seem to be banging on about. But uh, anyway, let's see what the power's like. Again, it's starting off very much like the Linkwood. We're opening with the oak. The oak is a little bit more toffied. It is a little bit neutral on the finish. It's a little bit sort of, mm, I don't really know what the hell I'm doing kind of thing. Um, it's got a bit of barley, a bit of, little bit of honey, a bit of gristiness. Um, like I said, I mean, inch scale, I can have a bit of a tendency towards neutrality. And this is certainly sort of edging in that direction, which is quite a surprise considering, considering the nose had a lovely multi depth to it. And, and this is often something I find considerably where the nose can differ quite a lot from the palate. And I think that, and I've said this on numerous occasions where I think sort of blenders and uh, distillers and what have you, when they sort of nosing, because you can't taste everything in your in your cask inventory, you, you'll have to go on your nose. And when you sort of nose it, you think, yeah, okay, that's in X kind of position. Um, and maybe you kind of go along with that and, and bottle it and m maybe you don't taste it, you know. Or, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of sort of hazarding guesses here. But um, it certainly seems to me that on the nose, it seemed to be displaying one particular characteristic. And on the palate, it didn't quite live up to that nose. But again... Quality wise, really good, um, and um, yeah, not too bad. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the Blair Athol. Now, um, one of the things I do love about the independents is, is things like this Blair Athol, which you normally see absolutely swamped in cherry in American oak. And um, let's see what the nose goes. A bit tight, but then it is nearing nearing sixty percent. Um, oh, wonderfully juicy, getting quite a lot of um, almost kind of grainy dried fruit, sort of slightly high toned, sort of sultanery sort of dried fruit. Um, again, barley husks, malt, cereal, a little bit of citrus, a little bit of almost kind of like sort of tangerine kind of notes um, but oof, I mean that's got a wonderful freshness I mean yes the the, the alcohol is kind of emphasizing um, those characteristics but it's a, a a pleasant sort of emphasis and it's also got that sort of slightly granity Highland kind of note as well and um, and although I think this is sitting on the shelf at 70 something I think which 
for a car strength 10 year old is a little bit on the steep side it is it's an impressive whiskey it has to be said I'm quite surprised actually that, that pretty much the entire sort of first range that they've released are all um, relatively youngish malts but then I'm guessing they're going for the establish and then we'll bring out some older stuff um, that's assuming of course they have older stuff in their inventory um, yeah, a bit of white fruit. I, I like I like Blair Athol. Blair Athol's a lovely whiskey, and you know it, it is often just completely swamped in sherry. But this really gives you the the class of that particular uh, distillery. So let's see what the palate's like. Again, and I'm not saying this is kind of like formulaic of this range, but it does seem to be a um, a key point. Opens with the oak. Opens with a fair amount of oak in actual fact. Quite toffied and and um, slightly creamy. The the high level of alcohol is is kind of containing that sort of creaminess um, and masking the finish to a certain extent. It's kind of bringing out some wood spices, um, some citrus as well emphasizing the citrus all kind of really tongue tingling i mean i mean that's lovely and intense i mean that's that's my kind of whiskey it has to be said i like that sort of intensity yes all right you you, you do lose a little bit of complexity in the higher levels of alcohol when you taste it neat but what you lose in one hand you gain in another but anyway we're gonna i've just put a little drop of water with it and just see if that kind of opens things out and um Oh, that's got really dusty now. That's really kind of dusty, fragrant, barley, a little bit of pollen as well. Um, oh, that's lovely. That really is a gorgeous nose. A little bit of cereal and malt and cereal husks underneath. Just putting that little drop of water really lifted that nose. That is absolutely stunning. Um, let's see what power's like now. Still a bit drying, but a real juice monster. Um, it's kind of cut back on the oak, which often has a tendency to happen when you put a little drop of water with cast strength whiskies. Emphasize the citrus, I'm getting the barley, the honey, the grist. Um, mm, a little bit of green fruit on the finish as well, a little bit of lime. Oh, that is lovely. That really is very, very impressive. And, um, mm, if you ever picked that cask, you picked a bloody good one. Oh, 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 oh. Actually, we're talking about whoever picked the cask, so I, built, I, I noticed it on the, on the label. And have a look at the labels. The labels are really lots and lots of information, which is just exactly what you kind of want these days. Um, the master blender stroke selector um, is listed as, I think, Robert Haig. Uh, I mentioned maybe last last week about all the Mackays and um, all the Morrisons in the whiskey industry. I obviously, forgot to say about the Hagues. I mean, bloody millions of them. Uh, I don't know which one this is, but I know there was a, a historic. I think uh, historically a Robert Haig set up Haig, um, the, the, the blended whiskey company. Um, I'm going to hazard a guess that he's a descendant somewhere along the lines. But anyway, um, so that that. Bloody good Blair Athol, really very, very good. Anyway, we're moving on to the Ardmore now. So this is nine years old. Let's, uh, I'm expecting big things from this considering how much I'm having to sell it for. Oh, just giving that one away, haven't I? It's on the shelf. Whoa, that's astringent. That's kind of, that's kind of sort of Jeremy Clarkson going out. Oh, uh, kind of moment. Um, <laughs> that's stinky. Uh, I mean, in a good way. Um, it's kind of sheep poo and um, uh, charcoal, not char, uh, peat briquettes and iodine. Mm, yeah, sort of iodine, um, but mentholated, intense, just kind of like, whoa, it's kind of grabbing you by the nose. That's a sort of, um, 
that's a, a kind of this is a wakey wakey malt if there was ever one and it is stinky oh, I love it <laughs> absolutely love it um, absolutely absolutely stunning um, 61 quid but quite, it's good fun has to be said all right, it's not a huge amount below all of that stinky sort of peatiness, but, you know, it's entertaining at the end of the day. There's, yeah, all right, there's, there's a little bit of barley, but, you know, with, with this is quite heavily peated for Ardmore. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen a Ardmore in, in, in various guises, and um, I must admit, this has got to be one of the peatiest Ardmores I've come across, but, hmm, let's see what the palate gives us. little mellower on the palate in actual fact but still quite quite stinky quite manurey peaty dusty bit of coal dust on the finish um, again it's a, you can argue it's a little bit one dimensional but what it does it does pretty well it has to be said there's a little bit more oak again up front but we're not talking as much oak as in some of the other bottlings but it is kind of rounding things off quite nicely uh, and giving it a bit of a, a vanilla sheen, shall we say, and softening um, that intensity. But nice spiciness, nice citric bite on on the aftertaste, and um, plenty of sheep poo. Ooh. <laughs> We're back to the signature cask series. This is the Blended Island Malt. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Right, well I can tell you what it's not. It's not Jura, for a start. It's certainly not Tabermory. Um, although in saying that, I mean, yeah, Tabermory the other day, which was pretty impressive, and I think they're cleaning their act up. But anyway, this has got a lovely fragrance to it, lovely sort of, and knowing the distillery, I am amazed, it has to be said, there's no kind of dirty notes, it's, it's kind of fresh, aromatic, barley, a uh, little bit of citrus, subtly peated, the peat is all nicely contained, it's got a bit of a crisp citric edge, I mean I was, I was kind of in sort of Colila kind of territory with regards to the peat, which it, it wasn't, um, lovely fruitiness. I mean, you know, if the distillery's young spirit, and I'm guessing this is not much older than about eight years old, if that dis the, the major distilleries, the major island distilleries, <laughs> quality was always this good, I'd be going, yeah, you're, you're sitting on the shelf again. Um, but anyway. It's a little bit of soapiness in the background, but I'm, I'm prepared to forgive it that. Um, I mean, it's partly because I'm in a forgiving mood and partly because I know the distillery it's coming from and etc, etc. And um, you know, that is a lovely nose. And, you know, I'm quite happy to stick that on the shelf. It's 45 quid on the shelf. And um, you know what? Yes, it's a touch expensive. I mean, maybe I would have liked to have seen that at 39.95 I think that would have been a better price point for this personally speaking um, so uh, but you know I'd have to cut my own leg off to get it in at 39.95 it has to be said um, some lovely white fruit some citrus you know it's really nice really really enjoyable let's see what the power gives us Fresh, barley, citric, got a little bit of malt, nice depth, a little bit of peat kind of coming through, does dry a little bit on the finish, salt kind of coming in, helping that sort of dryness out, um, yeah, nice peaty aftertaste, does exactly what it says on the tin as far as I'm concerned, uh, yeah it's a blended island malt, um, and it's got plenty of character, youthfulness, um, 
nice coffee, almost kind of chocolatey aftertaste. Um, good level of peat, nice balance. Yeah, what's what's not not, not to like as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> So let's some today's episode of the shop. I think um, I think it's a first tranche. Uh, this is pretty good actually. I think it's sort of setting out um, Mossburn Distillers kind of uh, idea of quality and style. It certainly seems to me that they're they're pick or they are bottling casks that sort of like have um, a lovely sort of uh, fresh nose and a little bit more oak on the palate. All right, you can argue that it may feel a little bit sort of um, a little bit samey, um, you, but I guess you can argue that you know what you're going to get, bar a couple of them. Um, and like with every independent bottling company, every independent bottling company thinks everything they bottle is absolutely wonderful, and it's up to sort of people like myself to sort of go, yeah, that's good, that's not so good, um, and the not so good doesn't go on the shelf and the good does so I think as a kind of like first first load of releases I think um, yeah this is pretty good and I really think you should sort of like have a look at Mossburn um, I don't know whether they're kind of going to be exported whether they'll get to some of the, the more far-flung markets um, I imagine they will do so in time Marussia is not exactly a non-global company, shall we say, and I imagine they want to get their wares out to as, uh, as many customers as possible. So it, they may well be coming to a market near you some sometimes. But if you live in the UK, obviously you have access to them. And certainly I think I think the space side is nice. And like I said, it's not, not, not hugely sherry, pleasantly balanced, interesting use of hybrid casks. Maybe I think it would. I would like to see them go a little step further in maybe some of their later releases and use use some French oak and um, some wine cask ends and all this kind of stuff. I think yeah, the world is your oyster, shall we say? Um, the linkwood, yeah, lovely, fresh, classic kind of linkwood. A little bit of honey, um, really quite impressive. Touch expensive, but you know I can kind of live with that. Inchgower. You know, it was a bit inch gower really at the end of the day. It kind of ran out of steam a little bit, shall we say, on the palate. And, um, you know, it, I, I haven't come across a huge amount of inch gowers that I'm going to sort of like, you know, absolutely rave about. But I will say hats off for attempting, <laughs> you know, nothing like a trier, as they say. Star of the show has to be the, the Blair Athol. I mean, yep, yeah, that is very, very impressive. That is a great whiskey, and I, I'm hoping that sort of Mossburn bottle a few more at cast strength, but maybe be a bit more judicious with the price. The Ardmore, well, yeah, what's not to love about the Ardmore? Stinky, manure-y, peaty, you know, kind of ticks all the right boxes if you like that kind of whiskey. If you don't, then you're not going to like it, are you? But... I do. And finally, the blended island malt. Yep, well, it's on the shelf, so there you go. That's kind of my seal of approval for, for what it's worth. And um, I think that's that's a really good, good whiskey. And I think it's a really good batting. And considering where the bulk of that whiskey came from, I'm kind amazed, it has to be said, considering my, shall we say, somewhat low opinion of that particular distillery. Um, but anyway, there you go. That's that's the bonus episode of the show for this weekend. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the show. Um, if you have anything to do with Mossburn Distillers or Marussia Beverages or Eau de Vie, Hi Helen. Um, I hope you've enjoyed my review of this and I've not been too unduly harsh. I think I like to think I've been kind of firm but fair shall we say but anyway so that's this week's episode of the show in the bag um i'm sure i'll pull something out of the hat next week that'll be equally interesting but until then all that's left to say is good afternoon and good running I'm not